They are all. I am Laura Matukaita, Media and Communication Manager at Gara Community. Welcome to today's CC Webinar Live Keynote and Knowledge Sharing Session, and thank you for joining everyone. We would like to also thank Broadin for sponsoring today's CC Webinar Live Session. Now I would like to welcome Eric Arhanda, CEO and co-founder of Apatel, to introduce himself and share his presentation with all of us. For audience, if you have any questions, please do use the chat box option throughout the presentation and during the panel. Also, after the panel discussion, we will have some time aside where you will be able to ask questions verbally by clicking on the raise hand button and allowing me to unmute you. Um, so over to you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, and uh, good morning. Good afternoon or good evening to wherever, wherever you're dialing in uh, in the world from. Uh, very uh, honored to uh, have the opportunity to talk to everybody today and hopefully to field a lot of your uh, excellent questions. Uh, special thanks to the team at Broident for kindly inviting me, my good friend Albert uh, and the team and, and Natalia, thank you so much. Um, AP Telecom has uh, been in business for the last uh, decade uh, plus. We specialize in submarine cable and fiber connectivity uh, solutions specifically for sales. Um, the presentation today is going to cover a little bit of what we see in the market, some of the trends that are happening globally uh, in various uh, sectors of the world, such as the Atlantic, uh, South America, Asia, and during the panel session, I'm sure we'll have a very fruitful discussion for all the, uh, the audience members that are joining in. So uh, let's kick off. Um, the current uh, environment uh, that we see from an AP Telecom perspective supports the um, uh, premise that the content as well as connectivity is being forced to the edge. So cloud regions are expanding on a global basis to uh, improve the quality of experience uh, as well as the latency for end users, whether that's a uh, enterprise at a customer prem or whether that's someone working off of their, their smartphone uh, device on a, on a global basis, wherever they may be in the world. And we, we see that trend continuing. Um, if you look at the, uh, the world uh, right now, almost half of the world has connectivity, uh, but there is half of the world that doesn't. And that other side of the digital divide constitutes roughly 48% of the world's population. So there's still a long way to go in terms of getting anyone, uh, everyone and everyone and, and anyone connected to the internet. Uh, next slide, Natalia. Um, from an infrastructure uh, perspective, um, telegeography has forecasted that um, by 2035, uh, believe it or not, there's going to be 41 new cables required uh, to keep up with demand. Um, the existing cables that are deployed in the water across the nylon, the New York-London route connecting uh, the Americas uh, to Europe, um, will have a certain amount of uh, shelf life. And as those cables become antiquated and need to be ripped and replenished, um, we see from our perspective um, a increase of new cables to keep up with the, the insatiable demand that uh, certain apps, uh, for example, this call, uh, I'm sure some of the connectivity required to support this webinar and the, the video and the sharing of the screen is actually running on certain cables. Now, whether that's on Hibernia, whether that's on FA1, uh, whether that's on TGN or on Havefru, uh, maybe it's on all of them. There's mesh routing that's happening. Uh, but the key takeaway that we see from an industry perspective is that the need for infrastructure will continue to expand and increase to support the demand levels that are expected to continue all the way out to 2035 and beyond. Next slide, Natalia, please. Let, let's focus a little bit of um, time on this slide. Um, the, uh, the ecosystem for uh, cable uh, for fiber, whether it be terrestrial or subsea. Um, we look at the total capacity and the fully loaded uh, cable project costs, which originates on the left-hand side of your screen where it says system operator. It's the, uh, the big uh, circle in, in, in black font. Um, this um, 
uh, is where it all starts. What is the cost of the, the infrastructure to deploy that, whether it's in the water or whether it's uh, in, in the, uh, the ground? Um, and then as we move our way in, a, um, in an easterly direction on the right-hand part of the screen, you'll see that spectrum fibers um, are large, um, large pur purchases of capacity. So a lot of the OTTs um, are purchasing in that sort of large block or large telecom operators. For example, those that may be in, um, in Europe may uh, see uh, Telefonica, Telexius would be uh, on that, that basis. For those that are coming in from the US that are viewing this webinar, someone like an Amazon, an AWS, and for someone in, in Asia PAC, uh, depending on your, your knowledge basis, someone like NTT uh, that has uh, their, their ownership positions on, on a spectrum or a fiber pair basis. Um, the subset below that in the blue line, uh, the wavelength customers are folks that may fall in into an HFTN space, a high frequency trading network firm, or uh, a company that is a, um, uh, a SDN provider, someone like uh, Zenlayer for example, in, uh, in Asia PAC, as well as globally. And then the more we move in an easterly direction, um, network users, uh, co-location, layer one, service providers, uh, VPN, all that kind of shows where we're heading. Um, there is a um, increase of need for connectivity on a um, diverse, resilient uh, basis for enterprise customers, which Broyden obviously is meeting that need. From, from uh, AP Telecom's point of view, we believe that the trend and the trajectory that's happening with MPLS being turned down is gonna continue. And uh, DIA, uh, Direct Internet Access or SD-WAN capability is going to uh, continue to rip, rip and replace, replenish MPLS uh, connectivity being taken down. So Natalia, if you could just uh, go to our next slide, please. Okay, so as uh, MPLS is being removed, and again, we thank Telegeography for, uh, for this particular slide, uh, it begs the question, you know, what's the plan for ripping and replacing and replenishing uh, the multi-protocol layer switching, the MPLS uh, technology, which is a little bit uh, disproportional uh, it may have seemed uh, the case five, seven years ago that MPLS did make sense, um, but it hasn't really lived up to its hype and, and, um, and hope. Um, if you look at um, the uh, respondents that uh, Telegeography uh, uh, polled uh, recently, they asked, um, who's going to have a greater capacity than your original MPLS? Uh, so 50% of the respondents said that. And I think the, the reason why they've said that is that you're actually able to get more speed, more diversity, more connectivity um, than you're currently capped at from an MPLS perspective. Um, the reality is that if you're in Manila or you're in Mumbai or you're in, um, in Boston, uh, DSL connectivity and DIA connectivity, local access for your home or whether you're at your work or when we go back to work uh, at, at the office, um, has uh, increased uh, tremendously. So Broyden is really at the forefront in the innovative aspect of this to take up the, um, the need for multiple DIA connections in one location, uh, manage central source billing, and to make sure that you're able to um, really improve your, your experience as well as low, lower your total cost of ownership by getting the same objective but a much more efficient, cost-effective way uh, than MPLS. So those are some of the trends that we see uh, in the marketplace from AP Telecom's uh, point of view. Uh, I'm very happy, uh, again, to be here and I look forward to the, uh, the, the, the session later uh, and questions coming in from around the world. So with, uh, with that in mind, uh, I think I'm just on time. I uh, wanna pass the baton uh, back to uh, Natalia and uh, the team as they introduce the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for this interesting presentation. It's been very, very interesting. Um, if our audience have any questions, um, you guys can type in your question using the chat box. Uh, 
in the next couple of minutes or just raise it or just raise your hand at the end of the session and then you can ask verbally. Um, so for now, I think people are still shy or maybe they were very interested in your presentation. So there are not many questions. Um, I see one question in the chat box now, Eric. Um, um, so this question came in from uh, Chris uh, Ali to all the panelists and attendees. Uh, looking at most lowering MPLS slide, which was the, the last slide that we covered. Uh, and thanks for your, your, your question, Chris. Um, how many respondents uh, did, did, were asked is the question. So uh, that was polled, that was actually performed the, uh, uh, by telegeography. And normally they do, um, on average, I, I don't wanna speak out of place here uh, because they're the primary source, but normally they poll pretty much the entire industry and we, we're definitely seeing the downturn in MPLS in markets that, um, for example, years ago, four or five years ago, would have been unthinkable. Uh, so in Asia Pacific, in uh, South America, and in, in, even in Africa. Um, so the ability to run linear uh, local internet access uh, connectivity uh, is becoming much more uh, efficient, affordable, and the trend, and we expect that to continue. So I hope that answered your question, Chris. Uh, thank you for your answer, Eric, and thank you for your question, Chris. Um, so now I would like to invite Natalia Dominguez, Marketing Director at Broadin Global, to moderate the discussion and welcome the panelists. Over to you, Natalia. Hi, uh, everyone. Thanks for, for joining this, this webinar today. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Broadin for those that still don't know our company and after that I'll be introducing um, all of the panelists that are, are speaking today. So Broadin basically offers uh, global internet access services and networking hardware anywhere in the world. We are a connectivity one-stop shop with presence in more than 200 countries and territories. And we partner with uh, over a thousand providers worldwide. Um, in today's uh, discussion panel, I'm pretty sure that uh, lots of you already know um, our panelists, some of our panelists, but basically we're going to see, we're going to be talking to Albert Bosch, who is the Broadens Commercial Director. And he's a uh, sales and business development expert with more than 10 years of international sales experience and five of which in the technology and telecommunications industry. So he's been focusing on Broadin's business growth for the last four years. And um, after that, we also see Joseph Woodyear from, the, from Broadin, uh, based in, in the US, in, in Austin. He's uh, Broadin's uh, managing director, Americas, and he has a lot of experience in the telco sector. He's been actually included in rankings among the most influential men and women in the wholesale telecommunication industry. And um, he's worked in the past for companies like CMC Networks, uh, Advantage Communications, and GTT. So over, he has more of uh, over 10 years of experience in, in this industry. Then there is Mario Bernal as well, who is here with us today. He's the brought in uh, business development manager and team lead and uh, he started working in the telecoms industry when he joined uh, cold technology back in 2007 and later on moved to brought in a few years ago and he also has a vast knowledge of the telecoms market as well and then we have as a very special guest uh, patricia blaker patricia is a senior product marketing manager at open systems uh, a provider that manages uh, SD1 tools and that it is uh, headquartered in Switzerland. And open systems enables enterprises to scale with uh, managed cloud native and secure connections anywhere. He's been partnering with Broadin for a while now. And Patricia, who's here today with us, she has more than five years of experience in the managed network and security services field and holds a 
let me see if I see it properly, <laughs> master's uh, science degree in information technology and electrical engineering. And she's also currently pursuing an additional uh, master's degree at the management, management technology and economics department of the ETH Zurich. And uh, finally, I'll introduce myself as well to you, um, uh, Broadens Marketing Director. I've been the main person leading the brand strategy of the company uh, for the past years, and I'll be moderating today's uh, panel discussion. So let's start after the quick presentations with the main topic of this webinar, which is uh, about COVID. Well, it's around COVID and main question will be, is COVID really an evolution or a revolution in the telecom industry? Uh, what's coming after this pandemic? What could we expect? And uh, first question, I would like to ask uh, Joseph, Albert, Patricia and Eric um, to see how they think, how is COVID an accelerator, an accelerator sorry, of change on MPLS network augmentation to SD1 from your perspective? What do you think? Do you think that uh, the end of the MPLS uh, is near? Uh, Joseph? Yeah, hi, Natalia. Thank you so much for uh, in the introduction there, and thank you to everybody for joining. Um, so, you know, I think uh, Eric's slides, his, his keynote speech um, was super interesting, especially with the, uh, the decline of MPLS. Um, when we look at that decline, you know, I don't think it's uh, uh, feasible to say that MPLS is dead, um, but with, you know, we are all seeing this augmentation and shift in the market from MPLS to SD-WAN. Uh, one of the things that I would say is that um, you know, if we look at what COVID has really done, um, has it been an accelerator? Who knows? It's a, we're in kind of a holding pattern right now, and it, I would call it kind of a reflection period. Um, so if we look at the end users or the, you know, from an end user point of view or an IT director point of view, um, you know, they're surveying the landscape of what this really looks like for how business is really going to work moving forward. Um, when I, you know, so... I think it will become a catalyst of change and, you know, significant accelerator of the, the move into SD-WAN. Um, but right now, you know, we've seen customers that have wanted to Im implement their SD-WAN a lot quicker. And we've seen customers that have said, look, we just want to hold and see what the landscape looks for, look like for our workers uh, when we get back to normality. What do the rest of you guys think about that yeah, so first of all uh, thanks everybody for joining the uh, webinar it's a pleasure to see a lot of friends uh reaching this uh conversation uh yeah following what joseph was saying uh we are in the same mood so we have seen this uh trend of migrating the mpls to the sd1 since 2018 so this uh, trend is not new COVID has accelerated it, of course. So we have uh, what we have experienced up to now, this beginning of the year, so this Q1 and partial Q2, uh, we have never seen in the past. So a lot of customers uh, accelerated their, their provisions of moving into the, uh, the SD1. So um, we have had a lot of work uh, this year, but uh, of course it's clear that the MPLS is not uh, dead. So the trend of uh, the upcoming uh, months and, and years, it's uh, that uh, the SD1 will keep gaining uh, a lot of uh, uh, marketplace uh, against the MPLS, but we, are, we keep seeing that uh, a lot of customers just uh, um, keep the MPLSs for the primary and headquarters. So they are still trusting a lot uh, the MPLS. Uh, and there are a few that they just migrate everything to the uh, to the internet uh, solution. So there is a clear trend of uh, of increasing this uh, migration. Uh, COVID has accelerated it. That's a reality. So everybody, also the providers, are saying the same that uh, we are as busy as ever before. And uh, well, we are now entering into an unknown space on the upcoming months of what will happen next. Okay. Uh, will you, Eric, or anyone else add uh, anything about the topic? Yeah, maybe from uh, my side, a uh, pleasure to be part of the panel as well. Um, what we can see, or we can definitely confirm that um, SD-WAN, that's the side we see, um, that this is increasing, the demand for it is increasing. And I think it's less about the technology 
and it's more about future-proofing current setups. And that's what we see with COVID now, that a lot of customers are need to tackle that now, um, rather sooner than later, that uh, to get the performant and flexible network and connectivity setup they need um, to have that future ready, meaning that um, this is also cloud ready, for example. And that's also why we see a lot of customers migrating away from MPLS to the internet solution. Uh, I think, Natalia, it's, um, as Joseph mentioned, it, it, it's to be seen. Um, I, I don't think anybody definitively could say this is what's going to happen uh, with COVID or not. Um, yeah, fingers crossed, uh, heaven forbid, there's not a second wave in November, December um, for, for any part of the world. And, you know, thoughts and prayers to everyone that they're healthy and safe. Um, I, I would say that the, the lines are certainly being blurred between fiber to the home, fiber to the education, fiber to the business. Um, so it, it, it's going to uh, potentially um, uh, make a, a different categorization or classification in terms of, uh, to Patricia's point, is, is there enough uh, uh, capacity to scale future-proof um, for the home? And is the home office going to become the permanent office? Um, how important is that? How, how important is mobility? Uh, satellite offices? Uh, I, I don't know, to Albert's point, how a satellite office that has eight to 10 people can afford MPLS in a part of the world where connectivity is very expensive. Um, so DIA may be the, um, the appropriate response, but, but it's certainly um, going to be interesting depending on the external factors how ICT budgets are allocated for enterprises, uh, no matter what, what type of company they, they're in or you know, banking, insurance, or, or manufacturing, it r remains to be seen. But uh, I think Patricia raises a very good point about future proofing. Okay. Well, really interesting. Um, I think maybe we should jump on the second, the next question. Uh, I'm gonna try to share my, my screen with you guys because I would like Patricia and Mary to take part of this uh, as we're going to talk about the cloud services and how cloud services can actually help businesses. Just let me share with you one second. Okay, I guess you can see it properly. Oh, now, perfect. So, okay. whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so basically, um, I want to show you the importance, uh, what, what, how important flexible and scaling services um, or right now or during this crisis, um, and what we have experienced um, and also why cloud native um, of the uh, cloud native services with the example of our mobile entry point services become or became very important. Um, and what is our mobile entry point service or cloud mobile entry point service? Basically, it's a remote access service that allows remote users um, which are mainly work from home uh, clients um, to dial into the customer's network. Um, I, first of all, to, to get access to internal data, but also to protect them where, while browsing, so for web security, basically. Um, we have the option to provide this remote access either on premises or from the cloud. And especially the second option has become crucial during that crisis. That's what we could, could see. So if you go to the next slide, um, what we saw um, from a trend perspective is that before this whole COVID crisis, more than 75% have been working from the office. So that's you and me, everybody was just going to the office and working from there. After the crisis, um, or during the crisis, maybe even after that, we can see the, it the other way around. So more, nearly 90% of all clients that we see um, have used our mobile entry point to dial in and to work from home. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that this trend was um, really global. 
Um, so on that curve in orange, you can see China that has had um, the crisis before. So there we could see the increase and also the decrease um, after the first phase. Quite um, not that significant because we don't have that many um, Chinese remote access users. Uh, but for US and, and Switzerland, since we're a Swiss-based Swiss uh, company, you could see that this increase, um, especially after March 11th, when most uh, countries declared this work from home policies, that this exploded. And the dip in the end, this was Easter, so nobody was working then, just if you wonder. <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, um, what we saw or what we could observe during that crisis is that um, the IT infrastructure was challenged quite a lot of many of our customers when enabling work from home. And there are three main points that need to be considered. First of all, the connection piece itself. Um, where are your global access points? How, how, do you, how good is your coverage globally, especially if you have a global um, company? <laughs> How um, do you provide access to internal and external resources? Um, most of resources, especially software as a service applications or external resources. And how do we make that reliable and performant and that connection from, from um, end users? And I think, for example, also there brought in this key um, to get good connectivity to good connectivity to these mobile entry points, to these remote access points. So we saw that whenever we had a deployment on-prem already and we had brought in connectivity there, we saw that um, also work, um, people that were working from home could dial in quite easily and uh, connectivity and performance was good there. But it's not only about connectivity, it's also about security, that you make that connection secure, that you maybe also have policy-based authentication to make sure that um, you use two factors, for example, for more, uh, um, more secure data um, and that you have access control and that you um, also enforce web security when uh, users are using the corporate device to browse that they are protected the same way as when browsing from the office. And finally, it's about operations. Oh, sorry. The last point, <laughs> um, which is kind of that um, it was crucial that we could provide a fast and zero touch deployment process because um, during those times, nobody was in the office basically, nobody was there to, to um, intervene if some, something went wrong. Um, that it's kind of device independent, that you have several options how to deploy, and that you have a central policy setup that you can steer easily from remote um, with us from operations also being working from home and that you have a 24 seven support, especially if you have a global global coverage. Um, and with that, I will uh, let also Mario co uh, comment on, that was a use case we could see from SEVN, but I'm pretty sure that uh, also Mario has uh, some comments on that, how remote, or how this crisis drive uh, has, has changed any behavior in connectivity or in regards of cloud services. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, thank you, Patricia. Yeah, I mean, internet is, is indeed a basic requirement more and more these days. It's, it goes on both sides because all the providers require the internet to, to give their, their services and, and their applications and to give access to, to the customer's network to, to the cloud services, for example. But then on the other hand, the, the end users and the remote users need also a reliable and secure connection to the internet so they can access the, the, the customers one, sorry, the, the, their, their companies one on their company's LAN over whichever way they use. Either they go through a VPN, either they go to a, to a tunnel or to an IP transit. Internet is critical these days. That is why um, I think it has been mentioned before by, by Albert, this uh, first, first half of the year, we've been seeing a very, very significant increase in the requirements and requests from our customers to provide um, quotes and to provide services because uh, companies and, and users know that they need to strengthen their network. They already have, or they might have uh, some, some secure network or some, some basic network, but now they need to strengthen that. And that goes by, by providing um, a reliable connection that they know that they can, they can be, they can establish a secure an added secure level 
of of uh, of service so they know that even if they they each one of their employees is working from home they know that their network is secure and thus their operations are secure so um, i mean i i, I uh, just heard the phrase that eric said before and i really liked it is is home office going to become the permanent office i don't know we'll see but we need to be prepared and companies know that they need to be prepared for that. So um, I think that um, companies like ours are, are in a very, very strategic and privileged position because these customers know that they need reliable services and they need to, to rely on companies like ours, like uh, uh, Broadint on one hand, providing the, the connectivity and then open systems on the other, providing the on top as the one. So they know that, uh, their, their connections is secure. No matter what happens, they have a secure main connection, they have a secure backup connection. So everywhere, no matter what happens, they will be connected and their company's operations will be secure. So it's all about that in the end. It's, it's internet reliability, security, and fast deployment, of course. Okay. Uh, so, yes, I think we could uh, jump on the next question that uh, is going to take place in this webinar. Um, I would like Joseph, uh, Albert and Eric as well to, to join on this specific topic. Um, I would like to know if um, you guys think uh, that there's actually a new generation of uh, global connectivity service here. And uh, if you think that the, gro the growth of the 4G is actually a real alternative. What do you think, Joseph? Joseph. Uh, you, I think you're mute. You're mute. Sorry, I lost the game of uh, webinar bingo. Um, so yeah, so if we look at 4G and 5G as a real alternative to uh, terrestrial connectivity or getting people actually connected or employees connected into a, a real network, uh, I think you know, it's, it's gonna be a, uh, a value proposition that can't go unnoticed, especially if we, you know, Mario and Albert both mentioned, uh, Mario and Eric both mentioned it, that maybe the home office does become the primary workplace now. So who is responsible for that connectivity and is it the employer or is it the employee and does 4G complement the home-based connectivity options that an employee has? Um, so you, we can use it as a complement to that. Also, if we look at uh, in, kind of the geography as of where employees are based. So if we look at remote destinations, uh, some remote parts of Africa, which you know, barely even have 3G connectivity today, um, you know, we have to still keep them on some form of uh, terrestrial link just because the quality isn't there. Um, so, if, you know, 4G, I think it goes to complement a portfolio of service offerings. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the only um, be all and end all on 5G. It's the same thing. It's going to be the, the only way to connect into a network moving forward. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that, Albert. Uh, yeah, that definitely uh, it will not be the main uh, point of access uh, in the future, but uh, based on the need of this uh, remote work that Dikavit uh, has put it in, the, in, the, in our lives uh, at the end, uh, we have created a, a new product, which is a 4G temporal solution to grant uh, internet access to our customers uh, within one week. This is something uh, pretty new in the market because the last contract term that we can offer, it's, uh, it's one week. Uh, so the commitment for these uh, laborers that should be working from home and uh, during X amount of weeks can be uh, just uh, solved. And uh, we have to say that we have uh, a really good acceptance in the market. So uh, uh, the commitment, as I said, it's only one week. And uh, well, we will see how this, uh, this escalation of the, uh, of the COVID situation goes and uh, if the finally the remote work uh, keeps being a, a trend in our lives, which it looks like. Um, so here in Berlin, for instance, we were working remotely, partially remotely. That's, that will be probably increased uh, after the, uh, the pandemic. So um, that's an alternative we are offering our customers. We try to be flexible uh, due to the current uh, situation. And uh, we try to offer the right products to solve these uh, potential pains. 
Yeah, and just to add to that as well is when we're looking at these SD-WAN transitions or augmentations from MPLS environments, it gives the end customer some flexibility in getting a internet service installed whilst the MPLS service is being downgraded. So we can migrate that MPLS connectivity onto a 4G solution, um, you know, so they're not overrunning on the MPLS contracts and that kind of stuff. So it's, again, it's a compliment. I don't think it's going to be the, the be all and end all for everything, every connectivity moving forward. I, I would say um, I, I certainly agree with Joseph and Albert in terms of uh, the connectivity options. Um, the, the trend that we're seeing is hybrid. So it's a combination of your, your Wi-Fi, perhaps at home, um, but the, the device, and this isn't the Brighton device, but I bought two of these in the last two weeks. Um, because uh, anybody that has children at home or folks that want to watch Netflix, that takes priority over sending out emails at nine o'clock at night. And um, I, I never thought we'd be fighting over the Wi-Fi uh, at home, but we are fighting over the Wi-Fi uh, at home because it's the entertainment source for Netflix or Amazon Prime. It's the education tool with so many young students uh, at a uh, university level, as well as a, uh, a primary school level, uh, young children that are out of school and ha are having uh, remote learning. Um, I, I've been getting up at 4.30, quarter to five in the morning, so it doesn't stop uh, uh, education or things that can be done on the house because the Wi-Fi needs to be shared. But th there are, are times where we're running hybrid. So for example, I know in our home right now, uh, a couple other people in the house are using this, hopefully not to play video games, um, but to, to do other things that are adding product productivity in their lives. Um, but to have that, that backup uh, to run a hybrid is, is quite important. And uh, I think um, I'll probably use this personally uh, when we do travel uh, to go forward, maybe for enhanced security. Um, but Joseph begged, uh, uh, brought up a very good question. It begs the question, Who's going to pay for that? Does an employer have an obligation to start to pay for uh, connectivity? Because if it is a utility like water and electricity, and it's such such a, an important aspect of of modern day society, and especially with what's happened with the uh, the pandemic with the virus, maybe an insure, an employer should ensure that there are tools for their uh, distributed workforce that has to work mobile. Maybe they should be paying for this, and it shouldn't be on on someone's home connection uh, because education and, and other things, entertainment are happening. Um, so yeah, it remains to be seen, but it certainly is an important, uh, intriguing question. I think it also could bring a potential product to the marketplace for the at and the Comcast, the Spectrums of the world who are providing home broadband connectivity to offer some form of more uh, SLAable SLA or a higher, um, you know, more of a business internet service from the home. Uh, I don't know whether that looks like a, a lower contention ratio on the core, or, but I think some development or evolution within the minds of the, the home broadband needs to take place within the eyes of the, uh, the local exchange providers, especially here in the US. Okay, um, so I am, I'm seeing that there's quite a lot of uh, questions on our chat box. Um, as I think we mentioned before, or maybe we didn't, but I mentioned it now, we were thinking of maybe asking the questions by the end of the webinar, just to keep it fluent and, to, and not to take uh, a long time on each, um, spend a long time on each uh, question. But if any of you guys uh, feel like uh, you would like to answer some of the questions now on the chat box, just a couple, not more, and then we will keep on answering more uh, go ahead if not we can just go to the next question i think we'll address some of these questions in the uh, the topics that we're going to talk about so anything that we don't clear up we can review at the end okay okay perfect so then i'll jump on the next question um now it's time to talk about how broadening can help actually can help our businesses and customers and i like to give the word to albert and joseph um so please just uh, let me share yeah. again my screen 
and we'll start here. Well, as most of uh, the attendees know, and as it was mentioned at the beginning, so we offer the internet access in around 200 countries and territories, acting as a one-stop shop, so one single point of contact. And the difference right now uh, in this COVID situation is that we are being uh, trying to be really flexible and with fast response to our customers. This is something that uh, uh, we are not applying it since the COVID, so it's something in our values. So since the beginning, we try to be really close to the customers. So since we were founded in uh, uh, 2012, uh, we have been organically growing per year. We closed last year 10 million euros revenue. We have been nominated and designated in Financial Times as one of the thousand fastest growing companies in Europe uh, 2019 and this year again reaching a team of 50 people. So uh, it has been an amazing adventure up to now. And we have a 24 cross seven uh, knock support to our customers. So I think that hard work and being really close to the customers, understanding their needs, uh, what they really need to sell to the end customers uh, has been key uh, to, uh, to show this, uh, this uh, growth. And uh, I think that the adventure it's, uh, uh, keeps growing as uh, numbers this year looks uh, amazing. So uh, Natalia, if you can move the next slide. Um, how we do that, we have more than a thousand local providers worldwide. So we try to go local to offer the best solutions possible in each, uh, in each country, uh, trying always to match the uh, expectations from the customers. So it's not a matter of price, it's a matter of a balance of quality and price, uh, trying to select the, the uh, uh, right uh, provider uh, to achieve the, uh, the customer expectations. Uh, next one, please. Uh, based on that, well, uh, we're headquarters in Barcelona. Uh, we have been expanding across the globe uh, in the last uh, year. So we have a point of contact in, uh, in London, our office in, in Austin, uh, thanks to Joseph and his team, and uh, part of our uh, knock in, in Bangalore. So we cover right now the, uh, the, all the time zones uh, in the world and uh, expecting good news end of this year, beginning of next one of the uh, next steps uh, of growing growth. Uh, Joseph. Sure, and I think we kind of went through this. The, the offering that we, we bring to the marketplace is that we have a, a full hybrid solution. So it's a best of breed um, product portfolio that could include broadband, dedicated internet via copper, fiber, uh, depending on the location, wireless or microwave. Some locations, obviously, satellite is the only thing available. Um, and then we use this to be the underlay for SD-WAN partners, just like Open Systems, which has been a, a really fruitful uh, relationship uh, and something that we're, we're proud to announce. And that's why uh, we, we have the team from Open Systems on today. Uh, and, and kind of, oh, you know, I want to say thank you to the, the carrier community here is that we've been able to grow in the way that we have is because of the support that we've had from, from the people that have joined this call. Um, you know, 99% of our business is, is uh, wholesale and we're providing connectivity to carriers. Uh, we do have some uh, agent model as well uh, that we have developed in the US in the past couple of years. You move on to the next slide. Exactly what I mentioned. So, you know, Open Systems has, has been a really supportive partner. Um, and, you know, I think the, the underlying principles that Albert mentioned is, is that you know, we, have, we are fast moving, we're flexible. Uh, we've done things that have been unconventional in the marketplace. Uh, this is kind of a saying that I have of somebody says no, we ask why not, and then we, we find a solution to get it done. And uh, it's, it's, that's the kind of mentality that we have that has allowed us to break into the, the telecom world in the way that we have. Um, you know, the, the team that we have is super hungry, and uh, it's, it's evident from every, every part of the business that customers interact with that, uh, we have a complete proactive and uh, support for getting uh, customer achievement. And you can move them forward. So yeah, um, Albert mentioned it, you know, why broaden? Uh, we only bring the, the best partners that we have available to the table. So um, there's, a, there's a video out there from uh, Jafra, uh, one of our colleagues in Spain who looks after all of our carriers. Uh, we, we go after the quality providers, not the quantity. Uh, so we onboard all of our providers. They know exactly what we need, what we want, how we work. 
uh, and we actually hold them accountable. So, you know, we could have uh, 10 different providers in the country and, you know, we'll, we'll rank them and uh, feed that data back to them so that we can ensure that they're giving us the best support, which in turn gives the end customer the best support as well. Um, so, yeah, we've completely customized this to a one-stop shop solution from quoting all the way through to uh, provisioning and support um, to, you know, make the, the carrier community's life as easy as possible when buying off-net solutions. Uh, the idea is that, you know, we come to the table as a complement to the carrier portfolio that carriers have. We know that there's a, you know, people have relationships, uh, but we want to be the ones that uh, can fill in the gaps of where uh, connectivity is needed and we have the experience and the expertise to, to provide that connectivity. Okay. okay, so then we'll jump on the next question after this, which uh, involves uh, Patricia from Open Systems uh, again and, and Mario. Uh, just, oh, I have the presentation right here. I'm just gonna stop sharing one second my screen and, and take it again. So basically the question, um, that is going, we're going to be talking about is why um, is uh, broadening an important element of global connectivity and I'm just uh, about to share my screen again. If you want to start, um, Patricia? Yes, sure. So it's, it's basically um, these this two different levels of having a solid connectivity layer below and then adding a, a performant and also smart network, SD-WAN network on top. Um, and that's kind of the part um, where I'm gonna talk about, about the part we are doing, which is usually <laughs> the, the thing on top. But then um, what is even more important actually for us is also what is underneath. So our platform, is apps is also hybrid we have, we have that word a lot of times already and i think today to have that co flexibility and that performance you need uh, you need to be hybrid and you need to um, support several different technologies and also several different layers and here in purple we have kind of the, the traditional WAN backbone um, on the the lower end where we uh, can ensure still with MPLS sometimes, sometimes with internet, doesn't really matter. Just a, a WAN connectivity of traditional offices and sites that need to be connected to each other. But we also have clouds coming in more and more, whether it's um, about infrastructure service or software as a service clouds, we need to include them more and more also to the WAN backbone. So um, you, you have also to think about how to deliver that that uh, flexibility and that performance to connect them efficiently together. Then it's also about uh, being, um, you can stay there, it's fine. Uh, it's also about the security piece and not only about the connectivity piece that, it's, um, that you secure it from the end device uh, to the cloud and, and, and having it secured within the network uh, zero trust is another key word you hear, you hear, hear often. So all connectivity and performance is, is worth nothing if in the end in, it's not secured. Uh, and for securing it, um, as a first step, you need to have the performance that allows you to secure it. So you need the connectivity as a first step. Uh, and that's why we see uh, the connectivity as a base layer for all SD-WAN and um, SD-WAN security or network security on top we can add. And that's also why we see broad in as key um, to just offer our solution on top of it and which is the base layer basically. Um, and now I hand over to Mario um, for, um, yeah, I said here, the connectivity yeah. layer here is, is more and more taken over by you. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pass to the next. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is uh, <laughs> a matter of uh, being live. So yeah. Mario, your, your turn now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, summarizing a bit everything that, that has been said over, over the last uh, for the last minutes, I mean, companies are shifting from their from their MPLS to this as the one solution because um, they're realizing that internet internet based solution can be as, as reliable and as secure as an, as an MPLS. I mean, 
and in most of the cases at a third of the price or even cheaper. We saw on, on Eric's presentation before that almost 50% of, of the respondents on that, on that uh, poll were, were answering that they were willing to change from to a higher bandwidth and uh, DIA compared to what they had on an MPLS, roughly 20% to the same bandwidth DIA. And um, it's not only because of the cost, of course, but as Patricia was saying again, then that's m mostly because of the flexibility and the speed of, of the deployment that we can offer and that we are, and that, that, that uh, what the, the environment and what the, the, the situation now forces us to, to be as fast and as flexible as possible. I mean, we can now deploy internet access all over the world um, very, very quickly. We, we work with a very, very strong network of, of partners and providers, and that allows us to, to provide this secure and uh, fast connection over which any SD1 solution can be easily adapted. And they can, the customer knows that they will have a very, very secure network um, it's much more flexible. It is a scalable, which is very important. And that, that is scalable just a click away compared to an MPLS over which they would have to go to the provider and ask for a modification. And the, the MPLS upgrade would take ages to be implemented. And, and now it's just a click away. And uh, partners such as, as Open Systems, which in my personal opinion is the state of the art of, of uh, as the one and, and SASE, this uh, secure access service, such as Patricia was, was perfectly explaining before, our customers know that they can just have all of their services in a single interface and in a single interface that can be monitored. And that is based on our connectivity. So um, to me, it's, it's just a perfect, perfect partnership. Um, this is pushing hesitant uh, CTOs and IT managers into this new solution, into this new market of, of uh, as the one based over, over the internet. Uh, we have to say that this is pushed over by, by the COVID situation, but uh, they need to reduce now their costs. And when they do, and when they start seeing the benefits, it's just, it's just a no-go. I mean, sorry, it's just a no-brain. Uh, it's, it's definitely the way to go because it's, it's cheaper, it's faster, it's uh, secure. Um, it's it's the future in one word. Okay, so we all agree that we are actually facing uh, new challenges. That's undeniable, and that's and that it is affecting affecting the um, the market. So I would like to keep on asking uh, you, Patricia and Mario, uh, if you think that is this affecting um, a quick service deployment during the pandemic? Yeah, definitely it is. Um, and it's also about um, this zero touch uh, deployment mode. Um, we had that before, so um, especially during the, the this pandemic uh, and it's still ongoing, um, nearly nobody is in the office. So if you need any intervenience from an office, from a deployment out there, um, it, it's getting hard. Um, I heard just from a coffee um, making company that they had that they had a strategic advantage because they had this um, uh, they had this this uh, remote maintenance mode um, just um, applied before the pandemic, and I think it's going more and more towards that that you can do remote maintenance that you can do everything from one single point where you orchestrate where you monitor everything where you have centrally um, managed everything and where you can also then push deployments out and, and, and do, do this connectivity with a click uh, away. That's also what, what Mario mentioned, that you don't have to go there and, and contracting phases of, of uh, months, that you just have a, a one single portal and one single click away uh, from your connectivity or from your SASE service. That will be key because speed, especially during times like that, and, and also change flexibility is key. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's all about flexibility, scalability, and uh, partners everywhere, including us, of course, we need to adapt to these requirements, to this uh, quick deployment, because, I mean, it's, it's all about the market. If we don't do it, our competitors will do. So we need to adapt to that. Uh, Zero-touch equipment, 
uh, pre-configured uh, equipment sent on site. So it's just plug and play. The, the customer receives the equipment, just plugs it, and then it automatically loads the, the configuration and then it's ready to go and ready and it's already connected to 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 the network to the SD1. Um, it's it's very very simple, very fast, and very very effective, cost effective obviously as well. Um, we can also talk about the, the wireless connectivity partners that uh, that 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 is then again another level of, of connectivity. I think it was Joseph that was mentioning before uh, our four our four G solutions that. Uh, it's just they can be we have some partners that can deploy up to 10 gig wireless in 10 days for example which is amazing i mean it was unthinkable just a, a year ago and now it's a reality and that is again because the market needs to adapt to the customer requirements so yes you know you know the, the pandemic is definitely going to change it has changed and uh, it is it is forcing us to 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 the new normal, which is just as fast as possible, as reliable as possible. Um, just there tomorrow. When do you want it? Tomorrow? Yes, sir. <laughs> we can do it. Okay, interesting. Um, and I have another question uh, for you guys, uh, Joseph, Albert, Eric, Mario, Patricia. Um, how does an evolution look like in the future? I mean, is there going to be a seamless way of uh, zero touch install services? Joseph, for example, you go ahead. <laughs> you um, go ahead. So the, the uh, looking forward at an evolution, um, you know, again, it goes back to my first statement. We're kind of in a reflection period right now. Um, and I think there's two different paths we could go down is what's, you know, what does that reflection period look like after COVID and what does an R and D situation look like for convenience of customer use? If this situation happens again, whether it be uh, a pandemic or something else that's somewhat life changing to a business environment. Um, what, one of the things that I would love to see is have a zero touch complete solution design where we can get services installed with the click of a button at customer prems all around the world. Right now, I think we're so far away from that with having to orchestrate all these different providers from around the world. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that Broaden has been able to grow is you know, what one carrier can't do everything. Everyone's relying upon each other to do something. Um, and if we could get to that true seamless touch, which is happening in a data center environment at the moment, you, you can get bandwidth on demand from data center to data center, turn it up and down at the click of a switch. If we could do that to a customer prem with 100 sites around the world, I would love to see that. I think that's more of a revolution, uh, but that, that's the thing that I would love to see and, and really concentrate on. And uh, I think the experience the, the end customer would have would be unbelievable. Yeah, from my point of view, um, most of the things has been already discussed, but uh, I think the good thing is that we are evolving all together. So not only ourselves, providers, uh, the ones providing the overlay. So everybody is evolving at the same time, which is good because uh, um, the uh, let's say new uh, trends are accepted by everybody. Everybody is in the same mood of understanding the situations, and it's really important because we are facing a real global challenge. And I think the the whole planet has been. Uh, in the same mood of understanding the uh, the pains of the end customers, so transfer to the ISPs and carriers, transfer to the uh, network operators. So at the end, all this change has been transmitted to uh, everybody, and we have been trying to help our customers with special requirements, uh, payment pay, payment um, alignments, mainly for U.S. customers. So. Uh, I think that's the good, uh, the good thing of this pandemic is that everybody has been in the same page, uh, more or less in the same time. And, uh, and of course, the next step is uh, this, uh, let's say, zero touch uh, future uh, that I think and I'm completely convinced that everybody will be in the same mood to find the right approach to deliver. So if the customer finally requests uh, X, uh, Y, uh, or whatever uh, to be done, the provider will understand uh, we as rolling will understand open systems providing the overlay will understand so everybody will try to do the best to uh, to uh, accomplish the uh, the request so um, yeah I think that's the the best thing that we can learn from this COVID situation is that everybody 
uh, are in the same uh, uh, shape and, and we are trying to get uh, everything addressed uh, all together. Okay, um, anything else to, to add? Maybe Eric, Mario, Patricia? Um, P Patricia, would, would you like to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, I, I think the, the, the two key uh, differentiators that have started to happen with, with uh, uh, the evolution is uh, pre-provisioning capacity a little bit what Joseph was talking about um, from a sub C and fiber perspective, more of a layer one of the OSI stack versus layer three. Um, we, we certainly see from AP Telecom's point of view that a tremendous amount of capacity was pre-provisioned with the expectation that it would be used. Um, so getting ready for that surge of, of demand. Uh, so definitely pre-provisioning. The, the second um, uh, takeaway and theme that we see um, is fixed contract terms. So the industry has been very um, uh, fixated for quite some time on a one year, two year, three year IRU, depending on the type of service that you're, you're procuring. And now this on demand or a variable cost structure, whether it's weekly uh, that Broyden is rolling out um, uh, with their new product, this, this type of uh, uh, device or whether it's a monthly service. Um, I, I think that's going to change. I think we're going to start to see customers in the wholesale space, customers in the, uh, the consumer space require flexibility on the, uh, the contract terms. So that, that would be my, my uh, feedback. Great. And maybe to add on that uh, regarding flexibility and, and planning on scalability and um, for sure, and we had that several times now, and that's, that's one of the major learnings. And what just popped in my mind is that that's exactly what cloud services are already kind of doing. And um, it's now our job and everybody has to stick together to find a solution to do that, not only for cloud services, but from connectivity layer to the um, SASE or SD-WAN layer on top um, to the, the applications then provided uh, through cloud uh, providers. So it, it will be, um, self-service functionalities, zero touch deployments, all that is kind of already the case for, for cloud providers. They are, but let's say one stage ahead regarding that and let's see how we can tackle that together um, to make that possible also on connectivity and on, on SD-WAN layer or on lower layers on the OSI stack as you mentioned before. And I think the, the key there is that everything there will need more consulting and definitely that um, customers re will rely more on on experts in the field on people with experience and on companies with experience and that's um, as as Joseph and Albert already mentioned that's going to be a, a team play and it's going to be a, a big task for everybody in the industry okay um, so we're gonna head next to the last question of today's webinar and we'll go uh, to our uh, success business case later on. Um, I would like to ask you guys um, what's coming in 2020. What do you think that um, the new normality is going to look like? So, uh, for example, uh, Joseph again. Uh, so you know, I think, again, we're, we're in this stage of what's happened next. We're all looking out of, you know, have we seen what has happened in the past that we can pull from to expect what to see in the future? Uh, so one of the things I was thinking about is if we look at the shopping mall, you know, is the thousand person office of 2019 the shopping mall of today? You know, are, are we going to see a decrease in the amount of people going to the shopping mall because they can do work from home? Yes. But does it mean the office is going to disappear completely? I don't think so. Uh, if we look at human values, people need, people want to be around each other. They collaborate. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to see people just shutting down shops um, or offices just because, you know, everyone's going to work from home moving forward. Um, so I think there's going to be this transition of, of what does the work-life balance look like from now moving forward and how do we manage that? 
um, combined with the product portfolio that companies need to be able to retain or get the most productivity out of their staff. Um, and you know, obviously, you know, all contribute to the cause of that business that's running. Um, so that would be one of the things, you know, that I, I would pull on is what have we seen in the past that we can relate to in the future? The other thing that I was looking at is, um, you know, when we've seen, you know, this is somewhat of a mini recession that we've been in right now. Um, what, what has really happened to the telecom industry after we've come out of a recession before? Obviously, we saw a dot-com boom. Then we went into 20, 2009, 2010. And you talked about, you know, people's private networks were built on layer one, layer two, or VPLS connectivity in kind of the early 2000s, late 2000s. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that I think we'll, we'll still con continue to see our growth in the SD-WAN market is that uh, one of the things that CFOs look at first when they're looking to reduce costs is the technology space and working out who, who needs what and how do we operate the most efficiently with the least amount of spend. And then ensuring, obviously, the security services and that there's no business complications that are, you know, by removing that spend, they're not exposing themselves to further issues down the line. So I think we'll see the same kind of trend of people, you know, not only moving in a technological, technological way of MAMPLS to SD-WAN, but, you know, people looking at ways to save costs and with downgraded offices, um, the convenience of SD-WAN, uh, I think that's going to become the new normal for, for the the telecom space that we're operating in today. Yeah, from my point of view, this new normality, it's uh, clear, clearly a, a social change that means a business change. So, uh, uh, well, at least in Spain, we're still not uh, in the new normality, so uh, we cannot even move between uh, sanitary regions. So what is forecasted? Well, we, we don't know, but it's clear that uh, everything will be new and the way of uh, doing the business will become more virtual in the uh, coming months and for sure in the years. So uh, remote work uh, has really arrived to stay. So I think it's not something temporal. Uh, so I think it will be less face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Uh, it will be everything more virtual in terms of uh, interacting um, in a virtual way, uh, more webinars such as the one we are doing, uh, more uh, digital trainings. Uh, also the... Uh, more uh, biggest events or the biggest events we have been uh, attending, they will probably uh, evolve to something different. So uh, uh, um, because uh, due to the social distancing that will be applied uh, next week, it's ITW, it's virtual this year. Let's see how it works next year. It will be virtual, no, but for sure it will be a hybrid between face-to-face -face and virtual. And uh, I was attending a webinar last week uh, from a guy that was talking about becoming more green. So I think that will be a trend uh, of the market um, thanks to the COVID. So uh, less traveling, it will be less uh, flights, uh, trying to be more green and being environmental uh, concerned. I think that would be something uh, that will be taken into account in the, uh, in the, uh, in the future. From, from AP Telecom's point of view, uh, we see total uh, wallet spend. So what you're spending um, for, for everything fully loaded from a, an ICT, uh, whether it's the computer or whether it's um, uh, your, your mobile phone bill um, or access in the office. And uh, that total wallet spend um, uh, has actually been a lot easier for technology to absorb, uh, similar to the points that Joseph and, and Albert uh, have made. And, and not to belabor a point, but I think uh, this plan here was like $800 and we added another uh, local line, but we had also uh, not consumed any of the T&E, the travel and entertainment expenses. So I thought, well, you know, it, it's, I'm, we're still better off because we're not traveling. Um, so I might as well uh, double down on technology uh, because it's an enabler uh, that promotes productivity um, there are challenges with that in order to uh, stay connected uh, from a touch point perspective. How do you um, still stay connected to someone when you're geographically dispersed? Um, how do you still find a way to connect to them, uh, connect with them? Because we're, we're not meeting next uh, this month in a couple of weeks in Atlanta at ITW. So there are challenges, uh, but I, I think uh, uh, Natalia, to, to answer the, the question, um, 
there are uh, certainly uh, uh, challenges with uh, uh, the, uh, the new normal. Uh, it doesn't mean that um, uh, things are gonna stay this way forever. But I, I think contrast is a, is a very uh, important aspect. There's many corporations and small businesses that are not as fortunate as us. Uh, I have some very close friends that have uh, been in the restaurant business, highly successful for years, and they're really uh, scraping to get by. They're struggling. So we, we do count our blessings. And uh, I think um, hopefully this will pass and technology will have been an uh, enabler to en allow us to get through this uh, turbulent tech period and patch. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, so if uh, we are done here, then that was the last question that we had for today. And um, we can just jump for the next uh, 10 minutes or so in order to be on time with uh, the whole session. Um, I'll uh, share my screen again with uh, one of uh, most success successful uh, business case of uh, Brodin and Open Systems. So just let me share it again. And Patricia, uh, I think you have the, you're the first one to start. So whenever it's you want. So it's a, again, it's a nice team play story, uh, just to, to add on what Albert says before. Um, and it's about Mammut. Mammut is uh, an, a Swiss company founded in 1862. All mountaineers of you most probably know that. So it's doing mountaineering and outdoor sports equipment. It's a manufacturer for that. It's part of a concepta of a group since 1982 and it has is his um, it, it's a um, headquarters HQ in Switzerland uh, but it's a truly global company with with uh, subsidiaries in Germany Austria France Norway and Netherlands as well as in the UK and uh, also in Asia Pacific like China Japan, Japan and South Korea and in the US 80% um, of the revenue is outside of Switzerland so it's really uh, with global distribution channels, um, whereas the clothing sector is the strongest one with 65%. And then there is a uh, followed by, by hardware, mainly uh, ropes for climbing and 25% of it is about shoes. And generally about Momut, the company itself, it grows with, uh, with the markets that it serves. So if you go to the next one, the challenge that Mammut faced was mainly um, with three parts or main pillars. First of all, that there was a very inflexible and expensive connectivity layer. They had an MPLS based connectivity with mainly Swisscom for, for uh, Switzerland and then Verizon for all international sites. And they had absolutely no visibility um, or for capacity planning um, to plan ahead. Then there was also um, an issue about, as a consequence of that most probably, that there was very pu poor application performance and also a lack of visibility um, on, on the next level, on the SD1 level, so to say. Um, and there was this, this complexity in managing multiple vendors that provided this overlay. So not enough bandwidth and control, lack of transparency and, and visibility, there, they used Riverbed for van optimization, so another point solution that needed to be managed. Um, and in general, it was not matching the business model they had because they, they needed to be fast, they had some M days going on, so flexibility was also key, and it was simply too complex. As well as the third pillar, which was the diffusing security, since they had this global footprint and um, expanded quite fast in some areas. Um, and increased complexity. Um, there was the need for, for internet breakouts um, to enable new offices and new sites as fast as possible. But that came also with the, the need for securing those local internet breakouts. There was a lot of shadow IoT um, since many software as a service applications were used and nobody had visibility on it. Um, and there were a lot of new demands regarding IoT um, in their manufacturing lines mainly um, and also traveling users all around the globe. So that was kind of the challenge in threefold. 
um, on the connectivity side, on the application side, and also on the security side. Um, the goal of the CIO was, um, after, after discussing it, was that he wanted to have all, everything from one provider. The, the whole WAN, the, the SD port on it, so the smart port on it, as well as the security. Um, so um, to improve efficiency of the global market, uh, he also wanted to have an increased speed of especially lines and more flexibility also in terms of lines. Um, and then it needed to be a future-proof solution, um, also including operations and the support of IoT, um, which was not known to them then, but they knew that this will, will be a trend and also cloud readiness since they knew that they will have a, a lot of application moving to the cloud. And finally, they required built in security that, that this is globally embedded and, and uh, zero compromise and security, no, no risk um, to have any breach or something like that. Um, so our joint solution, which finally made us win there, um, was that Broadint um, could deliver could the whole global connectivity based on um, various technology, um, but mainly replacing this very rigid and um, outdated MPLS they had and, and also very expensive MPLS they had. So they managed to, to provide best connectivity options in a flexible way wherever needed. Um, open systems, from our side, we added a line operation service on top where where we could um, be the single point of contact for anything regarding connectivity. And um, we added um, this overlay, secure SD-WAN on top, including VPN encryption on the internet lines, a routing intelligence, and also security prevention and detection. And finally, we also offer a 24-7 uh, operation center, a NOC, um, which is a single point of contact for the customer, also regarding everything from a uh, connectivity side. Um, we have a special model there, so we have only level three engineers in our operations, which makes it a good experience for the end user. So for the so, result, Mario will take over, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, well, the, the, as a result of that, um, well, the most important of it was the, the improvement in terms of, of, of cost, of course, that which, is the, which was one of the main concerns of the CIO, as we saw before. Uh, we managed to reduce the cost up to 25% uh, towards, uh, towards the internet, and indeed the flexibility over the, over the installations because, um, because of the fact that we, we were providing uh, internet access, and again, based upon uh, on, on our partner's network that we rely on, we were able to also provide temporary services while the, the final services were installed, which is a great advantage most of the time for, for, for our customers because uh, they, they don't have that window of, of no connectivity and that is critical for them. Uh, besides, obviously, we improved the connectivity up to, to five times in, in most of the cases because then again of, of the cost, the, the performance was also increased. Um, we in with terms of the of the network operations as i was mentioning at the, at the beginning of the webinar the the main purpose of of what we do is that our customers can focus on on their on their business on their operations so they don't have to spend time dealing with uh, local te teams of of support with local uh, procurement with uh, local providers in the end we take care of everything and that is again a very, very uh, competitive, very strong competitive advantage that we can offer to, to our customers. Um, in terms of the, of the future proof, which is again, something very important as Patricia was mentioning before, we, uh, we also, by increasing the local breakouts, or by, by, sorry, by providing uh, services through local internet breakouts that reduces the latency, that provides again that the, the access to the cloud is is uh, is ensured and the, and the, with a reduced latency is a faster it's a much more uh, it's a much better customer experience in the end all in all 
And on the other hand, we can install new locations very, very quickly in less than seven days in some of the cases here. Next one, Natalia, please. Um, again, since we work with such a, such a variety of local partners, we can uh, we increase the bandwidth by reducing the cost. Sorry, we increase the bandwidth and we reduce the cost, which is the perfect combination the way I see it. Uh, we're experts in that. And uh, again, I think I'd like to stress here the fact that we're the experts on the connectivity and we trust and we work with open systems, which are the experts on the, on the SD-1 that connected to what was uh, been mentioned on the previous question. I think customers look for these sort of partnerships in which they go to experts on the field for to sort out their, their, their problems. And that is what we did here. We um, shortened the, the time of installation because we, we released the customers to deal with local teams in, in procurement. We work as a, as a one-stop shop uh, that goes all the way from the, from the pre-sales phase all the way to the support. We take care of everything basically so that there's no much simpler procedures. There is a, a single window to go through on every single uh, uh, phase of the, of the deployment from pre-sales and sales, then through the delivery and then on support. It's a 24 seven, of course, it's 24 seven support. And uh, most importantly, is the flexibility to work with that we can offer. And uh, that is, again, the ultimate goal of everything is uh, increasing the customer satisfaction and providing a better customer experience. And that was the result of this partnership. Next one, Natalia, please. And uh, well, that's, uh, that's uh, just a testimonial from, from the CFO. Um, it's, it's definitely value for money. So then again, it's, it's what we look for, customer satisfaction, because at this, these days, then again, I'll say it again, if we don't do it, our co competitors will do. So we really need to be very, very strong. We need to provide very, very uh, strong and reliable services. So uh, our customers stay with us. And not only they stay with us, but they will also recommend us to, to, to some other customers. And um, that's what, what we want to do. Um, and I think that in the case of Mahmoud, it was a very, very successful case. And uh, that, that's what we went to, to repeat in, in all of the cases for our customers. So, okay. I think it seems like it, that was it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we are done with um, the discussion that we had uh, prepared for today. Now we're gonna go, I'm gonna go uh, for the questions that I see in the chat box. There are uh, 24 new messages <laughs> since last time I, I check. I'm gonna try to start from the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, we, have, we don't have uh, a lot a lot of time, but I'm just gonna go for uh, the first question. I think it was a 360 16 from Fabio Jose. I'm, no sh I'm not sure if he's still here, but what he was asking was, uh, so what is the impact of access of price reduction in Africa for connectivity regarding cloud service, regarding cloud service, sorry, regarding cloud service adoption? Um, uh, anyone that wants to jump on uh, the question I, is welcome. I think, uh, Natalia, some of these we have been responding to. Uh, yeah, uh, it might be. Extemporaneously. So, Fat, Fabio, I hope you're, you're well. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working in, together in the past. Um, we did respond. It was uh, about negative 20 to 25% CAGR uh, year on year on the IPLC portion. Um, similar to the Middle East, like Albert mentioned in his response to George uh, Jaber, uh, it's a different ecosystem in that part of the world uh, than it is in other markets. But uh, Fabio, I hope, I hope that answers your question and uh, also hope you and uh, uh, your wife and the baby are well. Okay, yeah, it might be some of the questions I see that you guys already responded. Sorry, it's just uh, hard to keep um, on track with all of them. Uh, is there... I see here another one from uh, Roxana Sanchez. Sanchez, I'm not sure if you actually responded on the chat box. If you did, yeah, with, just... with it. <laughs> okay, so 
let's do something. We've been on top of this, Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, but I've been so busy just sharing everything. Now I, I just lost uh, track on, on the question. So have you seen, uh, do, is there any question that you guys um, would like to respond if you've been checking the chat box? more than than myself uh, until now that uh catch your attention and you like to give a uh, an answer to albert for example uh, i think we have been answering all the questions so uh, i don't know if anything has been missed um but well if anyone has another question can be shared by email and we can answer later on with deeply the detail, but uh, while we were just doing the Mammoth business case, uh, we, uh, Eric, uh, Josh, and myself, we were answering all the questions that we we were seeing. So I think that it is done, and we didn't miss anything. Yeah, I'm just uh, giving a final uh, tag. But anyways, as like you're saying, Albert, um, all the questions as well that uh, you have been been able to ask uh, to answer. Sorry, uh, on the chat box um, can be asked later on because we can keep them on, I guess, on on a list and and answer them uh, through LinkedIn or via email. So. Yes, I think, yeah, I see that you've been answering some of the questions. So, uh, Laura, if uh, you want to take the conversation from now, I think we are done here. I would just like to say again, thank you to everyone. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to Eric. Thanks to Patricia. And of course, Thanks to, to you guys from Career Community for letting us know um, have this uh, amazing webinar. And of course, to all the people that uh, registered and finally joined. I hope um, they, they had a good time and got some good ideas from us. And yes, just to say thank you and, and I, I'll let you go on <laughs> from now. And yeah, that end up this webinar session. I uh, just congratulations to the Lucky Job in there again. And um, I would like to thank Eric for interesting presentation, Natalia for moderating, and all panelists for joining and sharing the knowledge. Uh, also, thank you for the audience for participating and listening. And congratulations again to Lucky Job in there. Uh, we are looking forward to our future webinars. And the, webin and the sessions planned for 23rd of June and 2nd of July. Um, for more information, please visit our event portal. This panel will be soon available on our CC Media portal and webinar live page in record and format for you to watch it. Uh, wish you all a good health and stay safe. Also, if you're interested to support and support or one of our future branded webinars, please use our uh, CC portal for more information. Um, so thank you again and I'll see you soon. Bye everybody. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much.